Good evening. Tonight in True Stories, two adventurers face the ultimate challenge of their skill and resources to find, climb and jump from the tallest cliff in the world in Base Climb. We're at 20,000 feet clinging to the side of this mile-high wall of granite and everything in front of me was just space. Falling off a mountain goes against all my instincts as a climber so this will be much harder for me. It's like throwing myself into the space between life and death. Three, two, one, one down, two down. I'm Nick Fatiris. I'm a base jumper. Base, or B-A-S-E, is an acronym for the four things to jump from. B for building. A for antenna, or a crane. S for span, which is a bridge. And E for earth, being a cliff. I've been travelling to different parts of the world, jumping off things for fun. It's been exciting, but I wanted more, more exhilaration, more of a challenge. I wanted to feel that pioneering spirit that attracted me to it in the first place. So I started selling this idea to jump from the highest cliff face in the world. Glenn Singleman. I'm a doctor and a mountaineer. I love climbing things. I've been the doctor on mountaineering expeditions in five continents. I enjoy a challenge, but I always thought base jumping was too risky until I met Nick. He's done hundreds of base jumps, but he's never climbed. I've done hundreds of climbs, but I've never base jumped. So we made a deal. I'd teach Nick to climb if he taught me to base jump and we'd combine our skills to climb and jump off the highest big wall cliff in the world. Look at this. I've got it. Look. This is it. We Look found it in that. a climbing magazine. Great the Great Trango Tower. Tower in Pakistan. 6,258 metres, over 20,000 feet high. Its granite walls rise 6,000 feet above the glaciers below. Hacking for a base jump is all about making it work right the first time. Generally there's no time for a reserve. Before Glenn can jump off anything, he must understand completely how the equipment works. I'm a complete novice at this. To me it's a tangle of nylon and boot laces. But I know I'll have to pack my own parachute at Trango. I'm putting my trust in Nick here. There's so much to learn. It's the objective of a good pack to ensure it comes out straight, on heading, and facing away from the thing you've jumped off. Packing for himself will force Glenn to think about what's happening every step of the way. It will force him to think about taking responsibility for himself, and that is the primary prerequisite anyone needs to go base jumping. I 
think the only reason it's been possible for us to have taken this on is that we both have experience out on the end of the limb. It's like base jumping's just another game to Glenn and the mental process of dealing with it is familiar. So it's a childish recreational fun activity with grown-up rules. I've spent several years in the US jumping off anything and everything because there are more big things in the United States to jump off than anywhere else in the world. But one day each year the New River Gorge Bridge closes for the Bridge Day Carnival and hundreds of base jumpers come to do their thing from this 900 okay. foot high structure. Okay. Three, two, one. Standing on the, the exit point, there's a feeling of respect. Respect for the object, respect for the equipment, just respect for life. And then this visual just explodes into view. Then the, the parachute opens and, and then it's elation. There's a problem then, this incredible aggression takes over. That's how I've trained myself. It's like the parachute is trying to beat me and there's no way I'm going to let it hurt me. It's bizarre, you know, it's, it's jumping off something. That's what I did when I was a, a little kid. It was almost a, a feeling of, I've played a game with this structure that is so powerful. It could potentially take my life. And oh, I can remember thinking of, of Superman. I feel like Superman. I can do anything. Death. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping from the Statue of Liberty was an idea to promote the restoration ceremony in 1986. They said no, but I did it anyway. <laughs> I work in the emergency ward. Adventure sports like climbing and base jumping seem a long way away from hospitals and medicine, but there are some similarities. Emergency medicine is adrenaline charged. It's really an adventure in medicine and great preparation for the uncertainties of expedition life. I think the fear of falling is like the fear of needles. The idea is worse than the reality. I've seen so much death in my life that it's just another thing that happens when I do a shift at the hospital. When I'm at work, any patient in any condition can come through the door and I have to handle it. All the time I'm dealing with life and death decisions. With climbing and base jumping, I take the same responsibility, except it's my own life. I think we're all victims of our lifestyles, smoking, drinking, even crossing the road, there's always risk. So I can't live my life wrapped up in cotton wool because that's not living, it's just existing. When I finished medicine, I felt pretty sure of myself. Then another doctor took me down the canyons in the Blue Mountains and a whole new world was open to me. is the best way to get fit for an expedition. Hurtling headlong into unknown territory, thinking on our feet all the time. I find these places as life-giving as anything I do in medicine. So I brought Nick up here to share the experience and train for our expedition. Preparation for Trango is more than a training program. We've had to make it a complete lifestyle. I've never been to high altitude on a mountain before. We're not taking oxygen and getting fit becomes just a fun part of the adventure.
Glenn, this is uh, the closest we're ever going to get to simulating the real, real conditions, the real thing in, in relative safety. Don't dive off, punch your chest out. Do it aggressively. When we get there, adrenaline, knees will be knocking, and we want to be in control of that. I mean, you know, you've got it all. Let's okay, do it. Can I have a stupid question? Yep. <clears throat> what if, when we go off the wall, I go head down? <clears throat> Why will you go head down? Okay, if you go head down, um, follow through with it. Okay, follow through with it. Don't dive and start, you know, um, <clears throat> Flailing. flailing your legs. Keep your shoulders level to the wall. Even yeah. if they're head down, as long as they're level, the parachute will probably still open straight. If they're okay. dipped this way, yeah. we'll have a problem. Right. right? But punch your chest out. To yep. prepare for a big wall okay. base jump, I have to overcome my fear of falling. Will be shaking too. We'll all be jelly. Yep. Do it. Okay? Okay. So Nick took me to a 130 foot high bridge and told me to jump off. Ready. Without Three, a parachute. Two. two. One. One thousand, two thousand. A bungee jump is like a ride in a fun park. You just hang on and get scared. But with a base jump, you are the ride. And if you don't keep yourself on the rails, you'll die. One. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand. So this is the safest way for Glenn to practice launching, which is the most critical part of the jump. Okay. Okay. Loudly. Ready. Three, two, one. That jump was like screaming on the inside. My eyes rolled back in my head. I couldn't see anything. My stomach was in my mouth. It was a lot harder than I expected. Glenn has to learn not to go head down or into a somersault. He must be straight and level at the point of opening to allow the parachute to come off his back cleanly, or it could wrap around him and not inflate. I practiced another seven times that day to get my body position right. Stand there, I'll go. Okay. Ready. Ready. Three, two, one. One thousand. I organised special permission to jump from the Sydney Harbour Bridge so Glenn could make his first base jump safely over water. The only thing I'm going to do is hold your parachute to make sure that it comes out. And then all you have to do is, is just think about connecting with the, the rear risers of the parachute to keep it straight. It's a dangerous activity. It's an unnatural thing to do. It's a denial of everything that you've ever learned about looking after yourself. And sure, I'm scared. The night before we do a base jump, I really can't sleep properly because I'm just thinking about What's going to happen tomorrow? Will I perform the way I've been trained to perform? I try to think about the particular organs that are being affected. In that case, it was my knees. They were trembling, they were jelly, they were weak. I could hardly move them. And one of the important things about base jumping is to have a solid launch where you push off with your knees. And when your knees are banging together like jelly, it's very difficult to actually overcome that instinctive okay, feeling and, and push hard. OK. I concentrated all ready. of my energy on making my Three, knees work. Two, one. 1,000, 2,000, and they worked. Exposing yourself to danger is fine. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But there is a clear difference between what is dangerous and what is irresponsible. If Glenn was to blindly follow me off a, an object without the necessary preparation, he would clearly be foolish. But when he jumps from Trango Towers in Pakistan, he will have an action plan for every possible scenario. That was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. I really had doubts about doing it. I just figured I had to face my destiny, so I went. <laughs> oh, God. I envy Nick's relaxed, fluid style. 
fear doesn't get in his way. He just lets go. Many people have this misconception that base jumping is illegal and that that must be part of the attraction. For us, this is not the case, and a large part of our challenge has been to get the authorities to actually rubber stamp what we're doing. It was my turn to teach Nick. We climbed Cornerstone Rib in the Warrumbungle Mountains. And it's a bit of a problem-solving exercise, but there's always something to hold on to with your hands or your feet. And if you do fall off, yep. the rope's there to protect you. Okay, so we're just going to go right up this edge, yep. then into the crack near the top, and over the top. And I'll go up first, and I'll set up everything so that you're safe, and you'll never fall more than four feet. Okay? Sounds exciting. Right, you ready? <laughs> yep. Okay, let's do it. It's a long, committing climb with a lot of space and air around, so you feel quite vulnerable. I don't think there's any danger of me becoming an adrenaline freak because I'm already one. And I've come to accept that now. I need to have my life at volume 10 rather than volume one and a half. I like to have it in vivid colours. Base jumping is about eliminating risks. With climbing, I feel I have to take risks all the time. It's this vicious circle. I reckon I can't possibly make the next move without falling, but if I stay in the same position, I'll fall anyway. So I go for it, and I don't fall, and then the whole thing starts again. I'm used to feeling vulnerable and unprotected, but in short bursts, not relentlessly. Climbing, it's scary and it's intimidating and I'm not yet aroused and motivated and excited by a good handhold or a, a slick move, which I need to be. I'm scared of it. base jump was the Australian Motorcycle Grand Prix. Nick had organised some promotional jumps from a 300 foot crane and I was the master's apprentice. I have to learn to deal with ground rush, the adrenaline overload of the earth rushing at me. Excuse, I think you should wear a camera on your first base jump clear. Live by the book, die by the book. That's right. Yeah, yeah you die, mate, you're in big trouble. This is it. All the preparation has to be right this time, because it really matters. This is hard on Arena. We haven't been married long, but she insists on being here, for better or worse. It's only been six months, and already he wants to throw himself over a mountain. Another aspect of this whole thing is watching Glenn's base jumping experience evolve and develop and heightened emotions that'll come from that. And that's also very intimidating because of the potential dangers and the fear of feeling responsible. And my whole strategy is to give Glenn the information he needs to make a good, responsible decision. Because when he's in deep shit, with this cliff coming up towards him, <laughs> I won't be there to help him. About a million things go through your mind in two seconds but I have to keep control of 
all of the emotions. So I have to keep my body upright. I have to be there when the parachute opens so that I can steer it properly. I have to be able to land. All of these things are being eaten away at by this fear and by this adrenaline and by this overwhelming sensation that's entirely new. And that's part of the thrill. Okay, this is the real thing, all right? <clears throat> it's no different, really. It's just that this time you're going to have more fun. Okay. Yeah? How do you feel? You're ready, aren't you? Yeah. My yeah. head says I can do it and mathematics is on our side, but yeah. okay, my well. guts and my heart aren't ready for this. All right. Take some deep breaths. Right? Okay. Deep breaths. And when you get up there, just give yourself a countdown right? to tell you, tell you when to go off. Okay. All right? Now, just as we practice, assertively, Push your chest against the wall out there, the imaginary brick wall, okay? Okay. Not incredibly aggressive. The only time you need to be incredibly aggressive is if the parachute didn't open straight. You're going to turn it back around the way it should go, all right? Okay, let's go. Let's go? Yeah. Looking good. Now, keep your arms up. I'll tell you what, Nick. Yep. When Roosevelt said, We've got nothing to fear but fear itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just he wasn't jump. standing in a situation like this. Be straight. Keep your shoulders straight. Looking good. OK. Three, two, one. So I could feel the lines pulling out, but I just thought, come on, open. And then whack, it opened up. Oh, fast. So it's like squeezing your whole life into three seconds. Out you go, whack, open, and then it's the ground. Now. <laughs> yeah! 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 <laughs> oh, God. And it was so fast. I couldn't believe it. I just thought, this is it. It's not going to open. I really thought for a couple of seconds, it is not going to open. And whack, it was open. I looked up and there it was. And I... The relief, I just can't describe the relief, and it's so alive, so alive. I often talk about base jumping as being motivated by intense visuals. Free falling off low objects is not about visuals at all, it's just pure thrill. That does look like fun. <laughs> oh god. That's a stunt jump, that's not a base jump, it's too yeah, low. Is <laughs> that hot or what? <laughs> oh, well done. Did you stand up? Bloody earth, that's too out. Congratulations. Thanks. Handled that really well. Um, critical moment, thought about the cameras, I mean, you know. You know what I said to him? Stuff the cameras. <laughs> These parachutes had only been base jumping once before, and I had to get them to open straight, consistently, so every time they open facing away from the thing we've jumped off. If it opens backwards, Glenn will have to get control quickly and turn it around, or he'll crash into the cliff. It's getting in control that makes it safe. We kept practicing the next day after the race. Glenn's third jump was a disaster. The filming had him going up and down several times with the parachute container open, ready to jump. Somehow it got twisted. When the parachute opened, I began spinning out of control. I couldn't steer it. I knew I wouldn't be able to get the line twist out before I hit the ground, so I braced for a collision. I hit a hot dog stand and scraped down the side. Amazingly, I didn't hurt myself, but it was a very sobering lesson for both of us. There'll be no second chances on Trango. We arrived in northeast Pakistan in early summer. Trango is in the Karakoram, which is the western arm of the Himalayas. For centuries, this area could only be accessed on foot, but now the Pakistanis are building a road towards China. 
Day in and day out during summer, four-wheel drive vehicles wind their way through this desolate landscape. Even though Nick's done a few hundred base jumps, he doesn't like being a passenger in a motor vehicle. I'm really reluctant to expose myself to dangerous situations that I don't have any control over, and, and driving is a, a supreme example. You know, I'm a terrified passenger. I hate being the passenger of, of a car unless I'm, I'm driving with somebody that, that I, I know and, and trust. Our drivers keep themselves awake with a diet of black coffee and strong cigarettes. These guys thrash their vehicles for 14 hours a day over some of the worst roads I've seen. What a waste of my life to drive off the edge of a cliff in Pakistan. <laughs> yeah. Nick's fears were well founded. The vehicle in front of us went out of control and crashed 150 feet down a rock slide, throwing out the 20 passengers. There were bodies and confusion everywhere. As the only doctor for miles, I took charge. It's amazing no one was killed, but 12 porters were injured, three seriously. What's he done, Dan? Yep. It's difficult to say. He could have broken one bone from his arm. Okay. We'll see it. about this other man, who's definitely got a fractured rib and may have damaged his lung. We need to listen to the back of his chest. It was a hostile place. There were no trees and no shade. I had to stabilise and transport the seriously injured to some sort of shelter, then break out the medical kit. <laughs> And I came on this trip to get away from the emergency ward. But the Pakistanis don't seem too concerned about risk and injury. To them, it's in the hands of God. Inshallah. Okay. Good luck, friend. I'll take you out back to Skadu X-ray. Okay. I backtracked five hours to the nearest hospital with the injured, while the rest of the team started the long walk to Trango. Just walking to base camp was an epic. Every day on the walk in, I was bombarded with some new hazard that might kill me. I mean, who's going to complain when you've got a porter in front of you who's got a 30 kilo pack and, and a gum boot with uh, no socks and a hole in them? He's handling it, the poor guy. Travelling light, I caught up with the rest of the expedition two days later. They're all right. The bad guy's got a fractured rib, half his lungs full of blood that he's going to leave. The other guy's got a broken collarbone, the other guy's got a broken back. Being in the mountains is like having an enema through your life. Everything gets stripped away. There's nothing except the raw necessities. That's what's happened to all of us, and you discover richness in your own world that you didn't know was there. All of the things that you take for granted you come to miss them out here, and they assume a new importance and significance. The melting glaciers have turned this rivet into a raging torrent. This flying fox is the only way across. days more trekking up the Baltoro Glacier, we got our first view of the Trango Group. Already we were 12,000 feet high, but the granite teeth of Trango still loomed another 9,000 feet above us. Hi, 
God. That is so big. Man, all this work um, getting here, I've forgotten that there's a, a base jump in the equation, Glenn. We get to jump off that big sucker. That's <laughs> so big. Oh. It's a monster piece of rock. All around us, stone walls rise thousands of feet. An early English climber referred to this area as the warehouse of crags. Two of the most experienced adventure filmmakers in the world, Leo and Mandy Dickinson, were our camera crew. The unstoppable Vlad Moros is a professional mountaineer from Russia. He was our insurance policy to get to the summit. New Zealand photographer Wade Fairley handled the stills and the second unit cine camera. I fell in love with Arena when I was climbing a mountain in Russia. Being here with Glenn is much better than staying at home and worrying about him. 24, 25, okay? Yeah, hey. Now, yesterday to base camp, 350 rupees, okay? The day-to-day -day running of the expedition was the responsibility of Jeff Gabbardy's, a New Zealand mountaineer. No, 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 no. It can't be five. You said 300 rupees. Now, On top of Trango at 20,000 feet, there's only half the oxygen at sea level. Breathing, moving, climbing and thinking all become more difficult. We had no idea what the launch site would be like, so it was important to dress rehearse gearing up. I was wearing five cameras and I wanted to make sure they all worked before we left base camp. Uh, we'll have to do a bit better than this, I think. Yeah. But... I mean, I'd rather just scoot up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 3,000 feet. Ah! I was concerned that Nick was putting too much faith in the rope, because there'll come a time on the mountain when we'll have to climb without it. We're not like rock climbing boots. Hey? We're not like rock climbing boots. The climb to Camp 1 was a gut-busting grunt over loose rock and snow in the avalanche gully between Trango and another tower called Nameless. This was my pet hate for the whole expedition. We had to start early in the morning because the hot afternoon sun would melt the ice holding rock together above us and let loose boulders that whistled down around us. Climbing, I'd be gasping for breath and I'd force myself to take 10 steps before a rest. I wondered if acclimatising to the altitude would actually happen or whether it was just a con to make me feel good. Oh, I guess this is mountaineering. Ugh. Suddenly the ground began to shake and we heard the crack and roar of a big avalanche somewhere over the next ridge. We couldn't see it, but up ahead Vlad got some still photographs. A few minutes later we could smell the flint and dust of the pulverised rock. We became friends with an American trio who were climbing a new route on the east face of the Nameless Tower. Somewhere beneath them a gigantic pillar had fallen away. We filmed this five minutes after the avalanche when we cleared the ridge. This raw grey face is the scar left behind when thousands of tons of rock were just dumped onto the glacier below. You can think that you know everything you need to know about the mountains and you can be strong and you can still be scraped off the face of the earth. A person seems so insignificant and puny and crushable. These tiny specks jammed into the crack in the centre are the Americans, just a few hours from the summit. Imagine what it was like for them when their climbing route disappeared a few hundred metres below them. It became annoying that this mountain was alive and would, would continue to avalanche and let loose boulders for days after. It's one of the things that I find interesting about mountaineering, 
I know of no other adventure activity where there are so many objective dangers where the participant has no control. We've now started to fix the rope out onto the snow, and that's going to be very hard. You know, we've got two rope lengths out there now. It's going to be quite committing for everybody. Right, so it's dangerous ice, full-on ice climbing? It's full-on ice climbing. Yeah. We've got no more porters now. We have to carry everything, and we're overloaded. You know, you're making it sound as like, oh, <coughs> holy hell, this is the, you know, my worst nightmare coming up. Unless we start really rationalising absolutely every single thing, including your toothbrush, we're not going to get there. It's a big mountain, and everybody just gets wasted carrying stuff up. <laughs> Hey Nick, it's mostly traverse till you get out to here and then you go up, okay? Okay. I was just completely focused on not falling. And that would have meant just, you know, sliding off the edge of a mountain. And that, you know, would have meant death. Just as well as a safety rope. I wonder how he'll go on the upper ridge. Still, the deal is, I'll get him up and he'll get me down. Over a couple of weeks, we made the journey to Camp 2 five times. The first of the winter storms had turned it into a windswept snowfield. Nick was quickly learning about the hardships of mountain life. Every time I had dinner with him in Sydney, we ate out in pizza bars or hamburger joints. At Camp 2, I discovered why. He's the kind of cook who even burns the water. He managed to fuse the dehydrated food to the bottom of the pots. I felt the pressure of time because we had one week to get to the summit, find a launch point, organise all the gear, pray for some good weather and do it. It's an extraordinary journey for Nick and I. We've faced a lot of dangers together and seen each other's strengths and weaknesses. We've learned to be honest with each other. We've got enough real danger to handle without our egos getting in the way. jump off Great Trango Tower, I'll be splattered across the bottom. So if something happens to me, my attitude is that it's the silver bullet with my name on it that's going to get me at one time or another. I'm much more afraid of the jump than the climb. And I'm afraid that I might not have the courage to match my own convictions. It's not overhanging. Any launch point is dangerous to get to. We'll definitely land hard because of the thin atmosphere. An evacuation isn't possible. Evacuate to where? But this isn't just a base jump. It's a great, big, problem-solving, crazy adventure to jump off the top of the world. So if you fall, you've got to know how to arrest yourself. So you go off and then roll onto your axe. And the axe stops you. From here to the summit, we'll climb without ropes. So Nick has to learn to stop himself if he falls. <laughs> you mean to stop in one go? Do it again.
weeks, we made it to the summit. We've all lost weight. I've lost about 10 kilos or 20 pounds carrying this equipment up. Getting to the summit is usually the high point of an expedition. But for me, the greatest challenge is still to come. We had to find a place that was safe to jump. My first big hope was that we could launch from the top of the ice cliffs. What an incredible place to be. It was great. These seracs are giant ice cliffs slowly being pushed closer to the edge under the weight of the ice behind them. Eventually they break off and avalanche to the glacier below. Every minute we spend here is borrowed time. We couldn't jump from the ice because it fell short of the cliff face. It was here that I felt closest to Glenn and I was reminded of what we were made of as a team because as disappointed as he was, it was plain and simple. We couldn't jump from here so we'd have to climb down to the main wall and find a ledge. So I abseiled underneath the overhanging ice to a place we call the underworld. It's high altitude, there's not as much oxygen, I'm not thinking as clearly and one mistake with my gear and I go flying off a 20,000 foot cliff. The most danger is that a piece or all of that serac could just come down at any time. But the rock ledge looked jumpable, so I went back to get Nick. We cleared the snow and loose rocks off the ledge. We had to be sure the face was vertical, so we watched the rocks and Nick timed how long they took till impact. After 11 seconds of freefall, they slammed into the glacier below. <laughs> well, we could do that. I'd call that a big wall base jump. That's exciting. Well, I'd say we'd open about, uh, about 18,000 and uh, we're landing at about 14,000, which is incredibly intimidating. And has always been my biggest concern and worry about the whole project. Fortunately, we've got a, a fantastic landing area in amongst a glacial explosion, which I, I can't believe, so I'm very happy about. We have a new landing area for you. It's about 130 metres long, or at least that's the bit we're clearing. That's great, Mandy. It's really good news because obviously, you know, 13,000 feet, that was the only sort of missing factor. Our landing area was on the opposite side of the mountain to our climbing route. We hadn't been there for weeks and it had melted into a big mush of ankle-breaking cracks and crevasses. Two days later, Mandy and Arena had set up a new site on the opposite side of the glacier. and slogging up this mountain for three weeks and it's the night before we're getting focused it's it's like the whole year funneling into 10 seconds and that 10 seconds will happen tomorrow no it's too late for second thoughts you only have second thoughts if you don't think you're going to do it dying climbing a mountain or or jumping off something has no romantic appeal about it whatsoever. Really, I mean, it's the, the ultimate failure of, of any sort of adventure activity. I don't want to die. One person's dream is another person's nightmare. Nobody has the same drives or ambitions or volume to their life. So are you saying that life will be richer tomorrow after you've jumped off? Oh, yeah. Glenn, 
will jump off the cliff and whatever apprehensions Glenn's had and however much Glenn's thought about dying and, and hitting the cliff where his parachute's not working, all that will be overwhelmed by a visual explosion. What I fear is that I won't perform as I've been trained. To do that would be to let you down, would be to let me down, but I might get myself killed as well. We're making the jump together. I'll launch off behind Glenn with my helmet cameras facing forward filming him and his facing back to film me. We also have cameras on our chest and leg. We don't want to miss a thing. But all of a sudden when you are standing on the edge and it's right there before you, it's difficult. Ready, three, two, one. <laughs> Spun off the ice, my head's off its own base jump, and I was rolling after it. I'm going head down, losing, out of control, I panic, come on, into a top. The pilot shoots, no, upside down, I'll just be red. a week from some remote third world town where we can't even buy a, a beer. <laughs> Thirteen thousand eight hundred feet. This is going to be the fastest landing I've ever had. Just before impact I pulled down on the back of the canopy with all my strength slowed down <laughs> and suddenly I was on the ground landing was more of the same Boom. seven kilos of cameras on my head and over I go
Then the emotions I held in from the jump just overcame me. I have never been on my back on a base jump before. But I was in control when it mattered, and I feel great. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. All I could think is that life is sweet, so sweet. A mountaineer on Nameless Tower was at the landing area. And I was concerned and, and remarked that I'd oh, made this, this great error and I'd, I'd done these somersaults. And he said to me that, you know, I shouldn't be concerned because only 300 people in the world would know that it was a problem. And I said that it was a real problem because they were all my friends. <laughs> the video of Base Climb is now available from ABC Shops.